Welcome to The Double Stop. I'm Brian Sword. This week, I've got drum legend Vinny Apice on the show. Now, I'm really excited about this one. I really feel that this is the first interview since I've been back where it all comes together in the way that it sometimes did on the earlier shows, where it's like this episode is this show at its best in terms of the full, the beginning of the career till today. Like Vinny really tells some great stories and you really get an understanding of what his career has been like. So nobody's here to hear my voice. You're all here to hear Vinny. So let's jump right into it. Here's my interview with Vinny Apice. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, grew up in a family. My mother listened to a lot of music uh, on hi-fi. And uh, then I had my brother Carmine, who played drums, who's older than me. So that influenced me to want to get into the business and play drums. Now, was it was that a case of him running off to go out and you sneaking on his drum set? Or was it pretty separate? Uh, yeah, we, we did that. Uh, he would be home. And then when he, he went out, you know, he'd go, don't play the drums. Cause he thought I was going to break them. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he was out the door, I played the drums, you know? And then, uh, la- later on he started teaching me a couple of things here and there. So, and how long until you started playing in bands? Uh, probably I started when I was 10 and um, I say I maybe started messing around with other players a year later, you know, and, uh, <clears throat> in Brooklyn, New York. So there was a lot, you know, it was, it was easy. There's a lot of people in one uh, area, you know. And when was the first time you got to hit the studio? First time was with uh, my band that we, it was a nine-piece band, four horn players, and We had uh, Jimmy Iovine, who is from Interscope Records, Beats Audio. He was a good friend, and he uh, brought us into the Record Plant Studios to do some demos. It was a really good band, tight. And when we did that, the owner of the Record Plant signed us to a management deal and gave us a rehearsal place up at Record Plant Studios in Manhattan. And we used to rehearse there, I don't even know, but a lot. And uh, that's where we met a lot of uh, famous people like John Lennon, Rick Derringer, uh, you name it. We, we met a lot of people there. So uh, he brought us in the studio and that was the first time. And I was like, wow, okay. And I remember it, we had to concentrate on my uh, meter more, you know. They set up a metronome, which was a light, you know, and I had to play. He said, practice to the light. And that was hard because it's a light. It's not a click. So that made me aware that, oh, okay, this is an important thing here. You got to play steady, you know, and uh, so I got on the steady train, you know, so I learned how to play pretty steady. And then that worked with Black Sabbath later on because uh, Tony Iommi plays right in the pocket, you know, a little behind even. So Now, the the, the myth and the legend of, of you and John Lennon of... Like, did you play a little, like, hand clapping on, on one of his records and, and back his band a little bit? Yeah, we did. Um, since we were there all the time, one night Jimmy called. He was producing John Lennon, and he said, we need hand claps. Can you guys come down and do hand claps? <laughs> but he didn't say who. So we went down, and then we walk in, and we see John Lennon, and we go, oh, my God. I was like 16 and a half years old going to high school the next day. And uh, there's John Lennon. Uh oh my god so we go in there and he put that we put the headphones on now he's talking to you you know right in your ear and you go whoa this is cool <clears throat> they don't teach this in high school so uh so we wound up doing uh hand claps on whatever gets you through the night and uh yeah he pretty much directed us to you know we want uh eighth notes here and uh or quarter notes and then eighth notes you know and, and, and so we worked with him and that took a it didn't take long, about an hour, a little more. And we met him, and we were cool about it. We weren't um, uh, fanboys, which was good. So he asked Jimmy, who, who was that? And he go, that's the band I'm producing. They're upstairs on the 10th floor. Ah, so a couple of days later, he came and uh, came in our rehearsal room, sat down, and he watched us play. 
and he really liked it. And we started hanging out. He used to come up all the time. We play pool up there, smoke joints with him, and uh, you know, got to know him pretty good. So it was very cool. And then he asked us to do a video that he was putting together. So we did three clips. We're in it a little bit, but we're still the band in there. And then we did, uh, he produced uh, the owner of the record plant's wife. She's a singer, Lori Burton, and he produced eight songs and we were the band. So we worked with him in that capacity too. And then he asked us to do a live gig. So we did a live gig in uh, New York City at the New York Hilton that televised worldwide. And uh, I come to find out not so long ago that that was his last gig. And that freaked me out. I played his last gig. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. The kid from Brooklyn who was supposed to be in school. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's like thrown right into the fire there. Yeah, I read that. I didn't know at the time that was his last gig uh, or thereafter, obviously. So uh, that's what I read and I freaked out. It's a guitar aficionado magazine. There's a big picture of John and the band, and I've got his arm, I got my arm around John. And it mentions John, of course, and it mentions me, because I'm the only one really in the band that wants to have a, a, a bigger career, you know. Um, so it was pretty cool, you know, knowing that. Now, was that history there and working at that at the record plant part of how you got the Rick Derringer gig after? Well, yeah. Well, Rick uh, worked in the studio. On a, he was probably with Edgar at the time, and, and he he was planning to put a new band together, the Rick Derringer Band, in about six months. So he heard the tapes we did, the songs we did, and he asked Jimmy, who's that drummer? And Jimmy said, well, that's Carmine Apice's little brother, Vinny. Oh. So... Uh, then I ran into him and he asked me for my number. He told me he was going to put a band together. So I gave him my number and about six months later, he called me and I was playing with a band called Axis down in Louisiana, three piece power trio. And uh, he said, I'm putting a band together, you know, I, w I would love you to play drums. I I'm looking for bass player and guitar player. So I told him to come down to Louisiana, Shreveport and check out the band I'm playing with. Danny Johnson on guitar and Jay Davis on bass. So he did. He came back down to Shreveport, and that was a big deal. It was like, Rick Derringer's coming. Wow. A big rock star coming down. And he came down, checked it out. He really liked Danny, and uh, he asked Danny to join the band. So it was me, Danny, and then about a couple months later, we flew back to New York and uh, put the band together with Kenny Aronson on bass. And Jay, the bass player, wound up playing with the original, original Tharna. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do it. He had some, he had a couple of kids and he moved to New York and, and they were paying him 50 bucks a week. So he, he had to do something else. He missed it. So you did a couple of records with Derringer and a live record. Yes. How was that experience then? Oh, that was fantastic. I mean, that was really doing my first record and, uh. I was like, wow, so this is how you do it. And uh, Rick was the producer on the first one. <clears throat> and he got the drum sound, which is a very high-sounding drum kit. It's not a big, uh, warm sound. He, he, it was more poppy, you know. And uh, I didn't know much about the drum sounds, uh, but I learned. And then uh, the second album was produced by Jack Douglas, who was doing Aerosmith, because they were in the studio there, too. So... Uh, you know, after the first Derringer record, we did a tour, and then, uh, yeah, we, that was the tour. Then we went in later on in the studio to do second album with Jack Douglas. And then we toured with Aerosmith. We actually opened a lot, a lot of shows on the uh, Rocks tour. So that was a big eye-opener, how to play on a tour, how to play in arenas, how to play, you know, how to how to do this, really. So. Mm -hmm. It was pretty cool. And why did you end up leaving the band? Um, well, after about two and a half years, you know, we were, <clears throat> I was like 19 years old and Danny was oh my God. Tw 20 <laughs> years old. Yeah. <laughs> I was 19. I already had this stuff, a career already. It was pretty, I was pretty lucky. And uh, me and Danny decided, yeah, we're still making the same money. We're not getting any bigger. You know, we were impatient. So let's put Axis back together and, uh, 
get Jay and do an album. And we did. And we got the album done, uh, RCA Records, produced by Andy Johns. So it was a really great, great sounding record. And uh, it was good. You know, we could have probably stayed together and developed that into a real, real powerful band, you know. So, but we were kids. So that lasted uh, a couple of years, two, two, three, three years. And moved back to L.A. and did some gigs and a little bit of a tour. And uh, then it started falling apart. We didn't have any management, really. So Right. And, and how did you get Andy Johns involved? Was that you guys got him in, or was that just the label just handed him over to you? That's a good question. I don't even remember. Oh, okay. <clears throat> but that album, it's got a really good drum sound on it. And uh, that's the album, when I first met Tony Iommi, he came in the hotel room with that album under his hand, under his arm. Oh, okay. And he went, this is good. This is good. So he probably listened to it because they were auditioning drummers and realized, oh, this, this guy can play. He's got a good sound. Seems to know what he's doing. And Tony liked it. And that pretty much probably got me in the band. Now, with that particular audition, like how did you even get in the door then? Were they, did they call you or did you hear what was happening and find a way in? You know what? Before that, I got a call from Sharon Osborne office. Okay. And this was when Ozzy was starting, they were starting to put a band together around Ozzy. And Sharon told me, asked, she said, you know, I'm putting a band together with Ozzy. And uh, we'd, we heard about you. We'd like to fly you to England to hang out with Ozzy. Back then, I was never been out of the country. I've been to Canada. That was it. So it was like, England, where's that? <laughs> um, I didn't stay in school because I was playing with John Lennon. So because you were already a rock star, I, I, I missed uh, geography. <laughs> so, uh, so I went okay. Uh, let me let me get back to you on that. You know, and uh, I asked my brother Carmine, who knows Ozzy and Sabbath from they toured together with Cactus back in the late seventies. And I said, I got this offer. Is, 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 isn't Ozzy crazy? And Carmine said, yeah. Yeah, he's very crazy. So I turned it down. I, I said I couldn't oh, do no. it. Oh, no. So And then about a month or two later, I get a phone call from Sabbath's tour manager saying, hey, uh, we just lost Bill Ward, the drummer, and uh, we're coming to L.A. We have four days off, and we're looking for a drummer. Do you want to come down? I said, Absolutely. So they said, do you want to come down and meet Tony Iommi? Yep. So I went into uh, Hollywood, Tony's hotel, and uh, Tony comes in the room. We met. We got along really well. You know, he's a jokester. I'm kind of a jokester. Both got good sense of humor. So we hit it off. It was like, okay. So he, Tony said, come down to rehearsal tomorrow. So I came down to rehearsal. I put my drums in my 67 Mustang. The drums were Ludwig uh, concert toms, so they didn't have bottom heads. So they were quite small, they looked. You know, four drums, bass drum, snare drum, two cymbals, and hi-hat, three cymbals. So I pulled up to SIR and, on Sunset Boulevard, and they helped me with the drums. Well, the road crew, not Tony. <laughs> and they, we set them up. And first song we played was Neon Nights because I just heard it on the radio. And I wasn't a huge Sabbath fan, but driving a week before, they played Neon Nights. And I'm driving, I went, wow, that new singer, Dio, sounds great. And I wasn't familiar with Ronnie that much either. And, uh, but I knew the song was easy to play because it just keeps going. And then there's a break right before the guitar solo. So I thought, well, I could fake it up to there and then just follow along. And that's what I did. So it sounded good. And uh, then we worked on a couple more songs. And then uh, they were so happy they found somebody. They went to the pub and they said, well, you're in, you're in the band until Bill comes back. But you're in the band. We got a tour coming up, blah, 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 blah. I said, OK. So they went to the pub and I'm there going, well, I got a shitload of songs to, to, to learn. So I stayed there with the keyboard player, Jeff Nichols, and went through these songs with the Walkman. Remember the old Walkman? And uh, so the same thing happened the next day. We played a little longer. Then they went to the pub. Then by the third day, they're going, oh, shit, 
we better get this together. And the fourth day, everybody was nervous. So I made a, a book with all cheat sheets on it, blah, all that stuff. So to get through it. First gig was Hawaii. It was like 50,000 people outside Aloha Stadium. And I had my book, you know. So the endings went on for a bit, you know. It's like the endings were playing. And now, now, no, wait, one more, one more. That kind of shit. <laughs> and uh, we pulled it off. And then it started doing the Heaven and Hell tour from the Heaven and Hell album. And, you know, we got tighter and tighter and tighter. And then uh, eventually Bill never came back. And then we were offered to do a song for the movie Heavy Metal, that movie. So at that point, we were in England, and uh, they said, we're going to do a song, and we're going to go to this studio. So we go to the studio, and we're, it's John Lennon's old house, because he, he died, you know. It's owned by Ringo, beautiful, beautiful mansion with the gardens. They had the pre, uh, dinosaur hedges 20 feet high, the, the whole bit. It's where he did Imagine, you know. The white room was there, the piano. So we went there, and they gave out keys, and I got John's room. I go up to the room. It says John and Yoko. And I thought, you know what? He just passed. I don't know if I want to stay in the room. I saw too many Frankenstein movies when I was a kid. So I didn't. I asked him for a different room. But that was an amazing experience, just being in that house. And you open a closet, and there was Beatle Platinum Records and Triple Platinum swag and air posters everything would fall out and we we're all going oh my god you know i wish we had a cell um cell phone back then with the cameras on it you know i took some pictures but not a lot so that was a trip you know so then obviously that we recorded the song the mob rules so that was the foot in the door it was like well bill's not going to play this song yeah bill plays what he's on he always has so now he's going to learn something that that I played on, you know, and it was still no word from Bill. So then it tour concluded and then it was like, okay, we're gonna take a little time off and get together for rehearsing and writing for next album. I went, yeah. And that's that was the mob rules. We did it in LA, recorded and writ we wrote everything and that's the way it uh, went down, you know. And what was the writing process on that? Was it a bunch of jams or did Tony show up with kind of half written songs and you finished it up like how did that all work no half written songs all jams <clears throat> tony was just he could fart out a riff you know <clears throat> i mean it's just amazing but tony had some riffs uh and we just jumped on them then ronnie was there all the time and we started putting what we liked together and nobody ever came in with a written song so it was all done that way. And that's the way it was done all the way, every album we made together, every D.O. record pretty much, you know. And, and except uh, Dehumanizer, there were some songs uh, that, G I think Giza had one song on that. Now, Mob Rules, that was Martin Birch. How was your experience working with him? Martin Birch, uh, he's very easy to get along with and uh, really knows his, his gear, and um, it didn't take long for us to get a drum sound, you know. And the drum sound was very deep and low endy, kind of similar to Bill's, but I played more than Bill. I, I played a little bit more on top of the beat than Bill. And, um, but Martin captured a great drum sound that fit with that, uh, the way we played together. So the good thing was we did a whole tour Tony Geezer and I and Ronnie, and we got to know each other personally and musically. So when we went to do the album, we were like a band, a real band. And Martin uh, was great at that. And he, he wasn't a producer that changed many things. He was more of a sound producer, you know. Then he had some ideas on top of that, and, uh, and it worked. It was great. He's a great guy. Did you record all together at the same time, or was it one instrument at a time on that one? We recorded together. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, okay, you ready? <laughs> Here we go. Blast off. <laughs> Run it down. Now, is that your preference on how to record albums all together in, in a room, or do you like doing it? Yeah. More yeah. It depends who I'm working with. It's, it's cool to do it because you inspire each other when you're in the room. I mean, now fast forward all the way to today. Uh, I'm in my studio here, and I do a lot of sessions here for different people and stuff. 
And I love doing it because, you know, I could listen to the song once or twice and then start recording and I punch in, punch in, punch in. But I work on the parts. I don't like that. That doesn't I can feel what it should be like. And by the end of the, the, the day, it's like it sounds like I really know the song well. <laughs> you know, I could do anything I want. I could change mics. I could this. So I like doing it like this, too. The end of the Mob Rules tour, you know, things seemed to break apart. Did you know this was coming, that Dio was going to leave? Or was it a bit of a surprise? Um, well, toward the end, yeah, I started to get the bad vibes going down. You know, uh, it wasn't me. It was between Ronnie and Tony and Geezer. And uh, Ronnie always had a solo record deal from Warner Brothers. So even when I first joined the band, uh, Ronnie intended to put a solo record out with all his friends on there. Carrie from Kansas, uh, the guitar, but people he knew, he asked me to play on it. So originally that album was going to be a, kind of a solo record. But then I guess it uh, wasn't working out with Sabbath. And then uh, one night we went to the, uh, also we did the live album, Live Evil. And that was a whole big thing with the mixing and who mixed it and who didn't, you know, all that shit. So um, then one night, Ronnie and I went to the Rainbow and he said, look, I'm leaving the band. I'm going to form a band. I'm going to form my own band. And I'd like you to come with me, you know. And at the same time, Sabbath wanted me to stay. So it was a choice. Um, but, you know, it, it was sounded more exciting for a new band with this amazing vocalist, Ronnie James Dio. And we got along really, really well. We're both from New York. We're both Italian. He's older than me, but we just got along great. So uh, had I stayed with Tony Giza, we would have been working in England and back and forth and back and forth. So I chose to, to do it with Ron. And uh, so that's what we did. And then when, when we finished, uh, we started okay, now we need a band. So we tried some L.A. players, guitar players, and, and uh, Ronnie played bass. And it, that didn't work out. Everybody was a shredder, you know, from GIT, that kind of stuff. So Ronnie decided, you know what, I want to make this band more of an international flavor. Let contact Jimmy Bain. We'll go meet him in England, and he knows a guitar player, Vivian Campbell, we can check out. And we got there, and... and Ronnie and I went to different clubs to check out players. We wound up at a reggae club. I go, I don't think this is the guy. So we saw some funny stuff uh, while we were there. And then finally, Jimmy got back in town. He called Viv. Viv came in uh, the next day from Ireland. And we got together and jammed. And it was like, whoa, this is kicking ass, you know. We recorded it on a cassette. And then afterward... Uh, we finished rehearse, practice, whatever you want to call it, rehearsing. And then we went for an Indian meal, of course, and then went back to the hotel. And Ronnie and I listened to the cassette tape of Viv soloing. And he just did some amazing stuff. You know, he wasn't a shredder all the time. He could shred. Then he went back to some really groove stuff. And so he thought, this is the guy, man. This is the dude. So, uh, and Jimmy, I just, Jimmy just assumed he was the bass player. I don't think Ronnie even asked him. He just assumed. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a perfect fit. And then uh, uh, about a month later, they flew into L.A. in the valley, and uh, they lived here while we wrote Holy Diver and, and recorded it. And uh, it, it was just easy. It was just a lot of fun, and uh, we had a great time, you know, so... And we did uh, Holy Diver. We recorded it at Sound City Studios in the Valley. So, And that album seemed to like kind of shoot out of a cannon. It seemed like it was huge right away. Is that my perspective from many years later? Mm -hmm. Or was it a bit of a slower build than it seemed? No, no, it went, it went quick. Um, because uh, the album was due to come out. And then we started doing some dates before then. <clears throat> we opened four shows for Aerosmith. And one show, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry got in a fist fight on stage. And Ronnie's like, oh, man, this is crazy. I don't want to do this anymore. So told Wendy, and Wendy put together something with us headlining with Queens White opening. So we did a tour like that. And then the album came out. And uh, 
started going up the charts, you know, about four months, five months later, instead of playing theaters, now we're playing forum, the forum and arenas and stuff. So it was quick, you know, the album, strong album. Now, for you as a drummer, what was the difference in the dynamics between Dio and Sabbath? Was it all the same to you, just music, or did you feel like you had to do things differently? Well, Sabbath, you're in the house of Sabbath. So you don't want to play things that sound light or boppy, you know. You listen to Tony's evil guitar playing and it makes you think in a different mindset. And there's certain ways I played that stuff that made it sound mysterious and dark, you know. Dio is a new band. That means anything can go. Anything can go. And... uh we did some crazy stuff, you know. There's a lot of drum fills on there. I couldn't play quite as many drum fills with Sabbath. And I, I, it's not just playing them, I feel them, you know. But Sabbath, yeah. I f- had to feel what the Sabbath sound was like. I was more in that realm. And uh, so Dio was like a new band. There was no album to, that you can't repeat yourself because there was no album before. So we had a ball playing, uh, recording Holy Diver. And then we thought it was good. Thought, wow, it's a good, good fucking album. And then uh, my the drum tech kept coming in going, man, it's going to be platinum. I said, nah, you yeah, know, we'll, we're happy if it sells good, you know. And sure enough, this thing just still selling. It just went double platinum last year. It's like, holy shit, you know. It's, we didn't know. You quickly mentioned fills, and that really has become a, a signature part of your drumming is your drum yeah. fills. You know, you kind of hear it, and I'm like, oh, I know who that yeah. is. Because it's, how did that develop? Because they are, they just feel like, I don't know how he's going to land this. I don't know how he's going <laughs> to land this. And you land it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? that's what the players think. When I play, I still play with Viv in Last in Line, and sometimes I'll go mm. off and do some long bar and a half. And he's just, <laughs> he's like... He knows I'm going to land it, but he doesn't know when. <laughs> and I can see the smile on his face. But um, I just hear it that way. On the records, I hear um, Phil starting where no man would start it before. <laughs> <laughs> I said I, I play Phil's where no, no man has gone before because they're in between <laughs> stuff. And, uh, and they end sometimes like somewhere. And uh, it just, <laughs> but it, works. it works. It works. They all say the same thing, man. Oh, yeah. And you know what? When you play like that, if I jam with, I do a lot of rock fantasy camps and we jam in there and we uh, play some cover songs and the cover songs, I could fucking play. I don't play the cover songs like the cover song. Now, I, well, you want to hear that, put the record on. I just go for it and pump, push the band. And then you can see these players just turn around like, whoa, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, where another drummer's playing, he's playing good, but nobody's looking at each other because the excitement it creates excitement and energy in the band, you know. But I, I, it's what I feel when I play. It's crazy. Okay, so you've done the first deal record and then the last in line record. It comes out pretty quickly. Let's so say you record, you tour, you must have ju- jumped right back into the studio again to do the second record. Yeah, that came up quick. Yeah, I think the idea was, hey man, let's hit while the fire's hot, you know, while the iron's hot. And because uh, we did the touring, then we started headlining, doing big places. And then I think uh, we let's get another album out you know so we started the album the following year in april at the caribou ranch up in colorado and uh same thing we put together the songs and that album i think came out in july or something like that june and then it was a tour so that was that was cool man i'm shit at that point i was 23 years old and 24 years old. I'm like, yeah, let's jump on the bus and keep going. <laughs> Life is good. And then the Sacred Heart, is that when the cracks started to form within the band? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, honestly, what happened was Ronnie started to take a little bit of control of the music. 
and it wasn't as loose as a holy diver everything's just yeah, cranked up let's play on 11 and and so is uh, the next album but a little less right and then sacred heart became more controlling producer kind of vibe and uh, and it was good you know but um uh, <clears throat> i always felt you know just let the band be and uh, let let it be loose so we did that album and that came out great but it was i don't think that album's as good as the other two so uh and that's when uh things started to get funky and then vivian leaves the band well vivian suppose well he got fired you he know, got fired because, from the band then yeah yeah there's a lot of business things that we had issues with and uh viv brought him up and yeah, which was cool. I'm glad he brought him up and uh, it was involved me too. And then we had our say. And then Ronnie decides, oh, Wendy, let's get rid of Viv. We, you know, we're big now. And just, okay. And you got Craig Goldie in the band. <clears throat> Craig's a good friend. I love the way he plays. But you can't change something that's magical in the beginning. It's like Led Zeppelin going, well, oh, John Bonham, man, he's getting too drunk. So let's get somebody else, you know. And get rid of them, you know. With Bill Ward, Bill left. So they had to get somebody else. Lucky for me. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) So so that's what happened. Then they decided fire Viv, and I was shocked. And uh, Craig Goldie comes in, and then it started being, not Craig's fault, but the music was gone down a bit, and then the attendance at the gigs were gone down. You could see it's going downhill so uh so that wasn't a good thing and then you decided to leave the band at that point right no i think what did the next album dream evil yeah yeah i mean after that tour with dream evil that's yeah it was uh it got to the point where uh I forgot. I don't. I can't. I'm mixing up the time frames. But I remember it got to the point. So Jimmy was gone. Viv is gone. It's me. Maybe Craig. We got another bass player. Or we could. It was just like this is not the same band, you know. And I wasn't really crazy about what the material we were playing. So, uh, so I decided to to leave the band while I was still young and and go pursue other things then i wound up playing with uh, jimmy in a band called world war three and they had a deal on disney records real heavy band and mandy lyon you know was one of the first singers to growl and you know all that stuff and that was fun we had fun we did a tour we used to scare people they didn't know what the fuck was coming on go play a little club and he had jet black hair down to here and fan blowing and we're all black. It's really heavy, and it was pretty funny. World War Three was managed by Don Arden, so that was a trip in itself. And then um, we did the tour and stuff. But uh, Mandy and uh, Mandy's a singer, and Tracy G, the guitar player, started fighting. They didn't get along, and it was like, okay, here we go again. And then I got a call a couple months later from uh, Wendy saying, "Hey, do you want to play with the boys again?" I said, "Yeah." Absolutely. Who wouldn't want to play with the boys again? So uh, they flew me to England and um, they were all at Tony's house and we haven't seen each other in, in quite a few years. And uh, But I, I, I kind of tricked them a little bit to break the ice. I told them, I told Wendy after we made a deal, I said, you know, I just got to tell you, man, I gained like 250 pounds. <laughs> I said, I'm huge. I said, I had to get a special drum stool made. <laughs> I'm always joking around. It's sick, you know. And she goes, oh, okay. What, is she, what was she going to do? Go, you know what? Maybe we'll get some skinny guy in the band. So they were all thinking, uh, you know, that I, I'm big. And so I get to Tony's house. They bring me in and go, Vinny's here. And. The three of them are in the studio, and you see them peeking around the, <laughs> the doorway <laughs> as I walk in. <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> and then it was like, we never were apart. It broke the ice. You know. So, it was so everybody was joke. getting along well for that record? 
Yeah, they were working with Cozy Powell. Now he fell off the horse and broke his pelvis. And all the king's men couldn't put Cozy back together again. So um, they said, uh-oh. And Ronnie wasn't getting along with Cozy. And it was taking a long time. They were spending a lot of money. So that came down, let's get Vinny. So I fly in. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the right one. Yeah. So, so many times this has happened. This is confusing. So... I started, you know, pl we started playing and then uh, it just started going quick. They had some songs written and some songs not written. Eventually, uh, Ronnie and I went home. Then we came back and they rented a house for us in uh, Stafford, England. St Stratford, England. Shakespeare's country. So Ronnie and I used to go fly in, live there for about a month. And we'd rehearse in the living room. And it was funny in the living room because Tony had this little lamp. <laughs> I had a little drum set. It was real drums, but Giza had a little bass, and Ronnie sang through a guitar amp on, a, on, the, cush, on the chair so he could hear him better. So we'd rehearse in sweatpants, and Tony sometimes had his slippers on. And I said, you know, this should be the next stage set. Black Sabbath in the living room. Go on stage, it opens up his little lamps and the couch, and it's got slippers, there's pillows on, on the couch and shit. So that's the way we did the dehumanizer stuff. And then uh, we actually went into one studio and demoed everything down. And then uh, we were waiting for a producer. We had a couple of producers come down that didn't work out. Uh, one guy started telling Tony what chords to play. And that's like a no-no. It's Tony Iommi, you know. And you're going, why don't you go to C from the G or whatever it was. We were thinking, uh-oh, that's not going to work. And then we finally got Mac, who did uh, some Queen stuff. He, I think he did some Zeppelin stuff, too. And um, he just got a fucking killer sound, a killer drum sound. You know, the drums are real loud on that album. So uh, basically, then we went into the studio they wanted to use and we recorded the whole album and then they were mixing i went home because it was kind of boring back then there was no internet there was no it was england they had four channels on the tv and it was like you don't need me to to mix here and sit there so i went home then when they finished the album ronnie came back to the states he came over my house with a cassette said well here's the mixes and we listened to it and the fucking drums are so loud i went holy shit <laughs> he goes, well, we wanted to make sure we could hear him. I said, wow, if I was there, I probably would have said, they're a bit loud. <laughs> but I love it, man. It's, yeah, of course. Kicks, kicks ass. Now, that album came out kind of right when grunge took off. Right. So there was so much hype for that record when it came out, but then it also it came out with grunge. Yeah, so, it came out the wrong you know, time. That's unfortunate timing. Yeah, yeah. We went from, you know, the big giant band down to play in theaters again and yeah i remember one gig uh we were staying at the holiday inn and we were taking the holiday inn shuttle to the gig <laughs> four <laughs> of us five of us jeff jeff nichols we're sitting there going boy we're on big time now you know i mean before we were on limos and all sort of tour buses and now we're in the holiday inn Ex not express they didn't have back then holiday in shuttle but we did it we did it and we kicked ass and uh, it was great you know people love the album now they go man that is a heavy album you know that they we we discovered it you know after that tour then just like but in the past you go to dio yep because it was some static going on between the band not me and uh and it was, again, I'm leaving the band, Ronnie. <laughs> I said, okay. So we stuck together and then uh, put a version of Dio together. I think it was with Jeff Pilsen on bass, maybe Tracy G on guitar. And we did an album, uh, Strange Highways, which is one of the few albums I didn't play a lot of fills on. 
because the, <laughs> so- the drum sound was so big. Mike Frazier produced it. Yeah. That it was, it's hard to do fast stuff when the drums are that big. So uh, we did that, and then uh, we did another album called Angry Machines, which is a f- crazy album. It doesn't sound like D. Dio- it sounds like Dio Pro- Prague. It's like Prague album. It's I, I listened to a couple songs. I'm like, holy shit! What were we thinking? Yeah, it's a totally different sound. Now, as a drummer, how was it working uh, with Jeff Pilson, who you've gone on to work with a bunch in, as a producer, but? Um, Back in, in that era, working with Jeff, how did you enjoy that? I loved it because actually at one time, uh, when was that, 89 or something, before Dehumanizer, actually I was in a band with Jeff. We had a band. I think it was called Tooth and Nail. Or, no, I think it wasn't Tooth Was that War and Peace? War and Peace. Yeah, I yeah. knew it was two words. And uh, so, we, you know, Jeff wrote a lot of the stuff. We had uh, a whole new band, this guy Darren Householder on guitar, Michael Diamond on bass. And um, so we played together, you know. And Jeff's such a great player, such a great feel. We just locked in. So it was easy playing with Jeff and getting along with Jeff. Then later on, he wound up producing the first uh, um, Last in Line album. That's right. Working with Jeff. I just talked to Jeff like a week ago. <laughs> on yeah, here. I love Jeff. He's a good, good friend and uh, yeah. killer musician. So after Angry Machines, when you left again, uh, what did you do uh, at that point? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> so I think that was around 1996. Yeah, mid-90s. Yeah. I don't know when you have so many projects. 96, 97. Uh, I, I, I think... Had another band together, you know, local stuff. Carlos Cavazo, Jimmy Bain. Oh, right, uh, okay. Me, called, uh, Hollywood uh, All Stars. And we just did some gigs and stuff. And then uh, and then I didn't, after that, I got into computers. And uh, I started taking all the Microsoft exams. I started building them. And I really got into it. And then, uh, you know, at, at the Microsoft thing, people go, man, you were amazing. Wow, you should... You should uh, give us a, a resume. I said, I don't have a resume. At that point, I was taking care of my friends. Uh, he had like a bunch of carpeting stores and he had nine locations. So I was networking them all together and take care of all the, the whole company and then other people. So I had a little business going on. So I was doing that. And then uh, people would call on the phone and go, is this Vinny Apice? I go, yeah. I go, what are you doing here? because <laughs> they wound up getting a gig at Verizon, right? They said, you got to give them a... You admit. So I made up a resume. I gave, gave it to them. They gave it to them. And then they called me. And they knew I played drums for Sabbath, but I knew my shit with computers. Wow. So they go, That's well, if you want a job, we'll give you a job. I said, really? You mean you come here every day and do the same thing? And So I never had a job. So I thought, you know what? Right now, I'm going to... I like challenges, so I'm going to try this. So I was in charge of like DSL and uh, T1 line support and stuff, and because I knew I I knew how to fix stuff like Amazing. that. So I did it, it for about my mind. Like, yeah, I, I did it for about a year and a half, two years. Then I had a vac- of some sort of vacation they call it. So it wasn't even a vacation, but there was a gig I did with Eric Norlander as I played on Lana Lane's his. This is an album and did some work with Eric. And uh, he said, do you want to come to Japan and do this? We're going to do two gigs. And I said, okay. So I think we left on Thursday for the weekend, played the gigs, did some interviews, blah, 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 and came back on Sunday. And then I went back to Verizon on Monday. <laughs> they go, what'd you do for the weekend? I said, I went and played two gigs in Japan. <laughs> You did? How'd you what? do that? And then, oh I, and then I had enough of that. And I went, okay. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what go. I was expecting out of this conversation, but I was not expecting to hear that you're a computer nerd. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely a computer nerd. <laughs> you know what? I still, I got, uh, well, two computers. One's a studio. I build them all. That's my other one. I built Carmine, his studio computer, and I remote in. I fix it. He's always got a problem. Oh, wow. Yeah. And... Uh, Got my niece's laptop sitting in the kitchen that's ready to go, a new hard drive, and upgraded the memory. 
Um, yeah, I'm a total nerd. I like the way these <laughs> things work. So. Oh my goodness. Okay, so heaven and hell. That ne- the next Sabbath reunion. How did that all come about? Um, well, they were supposed to do for Rhino Records the Dio Years album, which was putting together all the songs with Ronnie on them. And then, uh, then somebody came up with the idea, hey, how about you guys do and write a new song or two, you know? And um, that would help promote the album. So they, they had three new songs, and they were working with Bill Ward. So it was taking a long time to get it together with Bill. And Bill's great. I love Bill. He's one of my idols. And uh, But it just wasn't gelling, I guess. I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but they wound up saying, okay, let's call Finney. <laughs> so, because it was taking too much time. So they called me, I flew in, and then, uh, actually, that's when I popped the weight thing. I said I gained the weight, and the, that's when I did. And uh, so I went in, we were in Tony's house, and we had some beers and hanging out. And he said, well, let me hear the songs, you know. So we listened to the songs, that was good. And then I had Cozy Powell's drum set there. I said, well, why don't we get a drum sound? It was like 10 o'clock at night. All right. So I get down to play, and the engineer was, uh, was it Mike? I can't think of his last name. And we got a drum sound. And the next day, I wound up finishing two songs, finished the third one the next day. So what was taking forever, finished in the weekend. And we finished. And we went, yeah, this is cool. And then that album was finished. And then they decided, why don't we do a tour? So that put together you know, the tour, and we did the, the first tour, and then uh, that went really well, and then it was the time to do, let's do another record, okay, so that was The Devil You Know, and those songs were kind of put together, I really, well, with Tony and Ronnie, they did it with a drum machine, and, and I kept saying, why don't we go in a room and play these suckers? You know, because every time we worked with the drum machine, we go to Ronnie's house and they play it. And they go, maybe we should hang there or something. Or, okay, then the engineer had to program the drum machine. <laughs> and then make it hang. You know, whereas before, we were in the same room together. You go, let's hang there. Okay, you ready? Let's do it. So, that's my least favorite album. Um, there's some good songs on there, but it, it was... It was done a different way, and I thought it didn't uh, shine as much as when we play together. So, And then we did a tour, and uh, the whole tour, which ended in Atlantic City, New Jersey, and which the last song we ever played together was Neon Nights with Ronnie. And that was the first song I ever played with Ronnie. Mm. Yeah, in 1980, <laughs> yeah, full circle. That one song because it's been moved around in the set. So for the devil, you know, did you record your drums at the end then and replace the drum machine, or is that just a drum machine? Um, you know, we were working at Ronnie's, getting it all together. Then I think we went to England. We went to Wales. That's where we did a lot of the work. And then I put the drums down. You know, and. Uh, we played it live, but at that point, like we played it a couple times, then I didn't really feel like I would, should be in that song. So I tell Tony and Gage, you don't have to play it again. We have you guys on, on tape already. So I'll just play it to that. And that's how a lot of those drum tracks went out, which is fine too, because it was easier than the keep everybody in the studio and I'm not happy yet, you know. Okay, so that was your last Neon Nights and, you know, the, your career with Sabbath with, with Ronnie. Like, did you know at that point he was sick or was that a little bit of a surprise that came later? Uh, I didn't know he was that sick. I mean, he would complain about his uh, stomach. He, he talked to Tony more. He, he even told Tony, Tony said, he said, I think I got cancer. And Tony goes, no, nah, no, nah, you probably go, 
go to the doctor. You probably got it's a gas thing. But Ronnie didn't eat. He didn't eat really good. He didn't like vegetables. He only liked certain foods. He loved Indian food. And a lot of times uh, we traveled. We traveled from L.A. all the way to London, and he didn't eat anything. He had a couple beers at the bar before we left. And then we get to England, and then it was in the morning, and then he'd go, let's go for an Indian later on. And that probably wasn't great for his stomach, eating Indian food on an empty stomach. <clears throat> so he didn't eat vegetables and, you know, he didn't eat salads, hated that stuff. So uh, then we found out uh, he's got cancer. I went, oh, fuck. Stage four. They told Ronnie, you got stage four stomach cancer. But he thought it went to 10. So he thought stage four was, okay, we better take care of this, you know. He didn't go for colonoscopies. He didn't do any of that stuff. So um, that we heard, okay, this is, this is not good. But then he was getting treatment, and he seemed to respond to it. And um, we were keeping our fingers crossed. And that was kind of the end of the year. And then the following year, we were supposed to go out and do some dates in June. And then uh, Ronnie called. Uh, he said, look, I'd like to get together, because Geezer lived in L.A. at that time, with you and Geezer and me, and just go through some stuff so I could sing before Tony comes in. You know, I wanted to get strong again. So it was kind of sad, you know. And then uh, that's what, uh, that never happened, actually. He said that, and then, uh, but before that, let me back up, we were doing the album, uh, what was the live thing? Maybe it was the movie, the DVD. And he had to replace some part, like a little bit of a part, not much. He didn't, re you know, just a couple of words. And, he, and we were all, it was just me and the engineer, Wynn Davis, and, and Ronnie were in the studio. And we're going, I wonder how this is going to go, because he hasn't sang, he's been doing chemo. And if it was going to be dodgy, you know. But, okay, ready, do it, boom. And he sang it. It was like, I was insane. It's amazing, you know. It was only a couple of words, but he had to do fix a couple of parts. But he was, he was like, well, yeah, good news, you know. And then the next thing, we were going to get together to rehearse, but then he got worse. And then, then uh, Wendy said, you better come to the hospital. Uh, he's not looking... It's not looking good. So, oh, shit. So that was weird. You know, a funeral, what's one member of the band in the casket is really horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, so. And I think you were, you two were so important for each other's career and legacy. I, I, I believe, as far as I know, you were the most consistent band member of from the beginning of his career with Sabbath until the end. Like, yeah. you were the most consistent guy that was always, almost always there with him. Yeah. Well, he was like a brother, you know. I mean, uh, he would come over to my house. We'd play cards, a couple of friends. When his parents were in town, they'd come over with Ron, and we'd, we'd, we'd make Italian food and play cards with them. Uh, we did a lot of stuff together. And Ronnie was into... Uh, home repair <laughs> oh really yeah yeah he liked to fix things like i do and I, I built him a computer back then uh and we used to go to home depot and go okay we need to fix this these whatever it was and we need to go look for parts and that's what we did uh we'd go walk in home depot and he gets stopped oh ronnie james Dio, yeah <laughs> and we buy stuff and go back and fix it one time we went over to pilson's house jeff pilson and we get there and we look and Jeff's sprinklers in the front are all fucked up. Pipes cracked and we go, look at that. He doesn't know how to do it. Jeff doesn't know how to repair anything. <laughs> I mean, he's lost. So we go in, talk to Jeff, we go, Hey Jeff, we're gonna go to Home Depot and fix your sprinklers for you. Oh man, you guys So me and Ronnie went to Home Depot and we bought some sprinkler stuff and we replaced that section of the pipe and put new heads on and a whole bit. And uh, so we fixed Jeff's sprinklers. And Ronnie loved it, you know. So he was always doing stuff in his house. I'd go over and help him and, you know, 
You got to do know. something when you're off. You can't be a rock star. Some people can be a rock star 25 hours a day. When I come home, I'm like, you know, I used to work on my cars. That uh, I don't do that anymore. But uh, I work on the house and uh, put in all new faucets and shut off valves, a uh, water pressure regulator. Uh, you, I do all this stuff. I'm the maintenance guy. I don't know. There's a picture, a mental picture of you and Ronnie James Dio walking around Home Depot feels almost <laughs> like a Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's funny because I went into Home Depot, the one by me now, there's not the same one, and the Holy Diver comes on. Oh, my God. So I took the phone <laughs> on and I did a video. I went, listen to that. And look where I am, Home Depot. Amazing. So Okay. So you toured with George Lynch. And is yeah. that where the Andrew Freeman connection comes in? Yes, because uh, that was a long time ago. Because George, first of all, plays on 11 all the time. It's really loud. And uh, he books like 20 shows in a row. You know, boom, 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 boom. And we, we did that. And we were riding in a van. It was terrible. And Andy could sing all that shit. He sang it all, 20 shows in a row. Uh, he took care of himself, didn't smoke, didn't really drink, and he's always having tea and all that stuff. So I said, man, give me your number, man. I've never met anybody who can do, sing 20 shows in a row at this volume. So we kept in touch. And uh, when it came time for uh, Last in Line, that, that happened by Viv calling me up. Calls up, hey, Vinny, it's Viv. Hey, I'm in town. Uh, I just spoke to Jimmy. He says, you want to get together and just jam, you know, play some of the old shit? And I said, yeah, that would be fun. So we got together, the three of us, and, and we started playing. And we had a good time trying to remember the parts, trying to remember the solos. We had a good laugh. And then it was so good that we said, why don't we do it next week? And then I told him, I might know this guy, Andy, that can come down and sing. He knows the songs. And I called Andy, and the next week, Andy came down, and he started singing these songs. He knew them all. And uh, we were all blown away, like, holy shit. This is fucking strong, you know? So that's how the band started, you know? We didn't want a guy that sounded like Ronnie. That was kind of stupid, but uh, we wanted somebody that can do justice to these songs. And um, and Andy came down and just blew everybody away, and then... Uh, Great. And our manager at the time, Steve Strange, is a big promoter in Europe. And uh, he got us a record deal on Frontier Records for two albums. And um, that got us started. And he booked some dates for us. And so we started rolling along. Now we're still going, you know. Although now we're going to stop after these. We got two shows coming up. And then we're going to stop probably till next year because Def Leppard's going out. And then uh, Vivian's got to take care of some of his personal medical stuff, you know. Yeah, he's fighting cancer as well. So it's a, yeah, it's and that's been a long time fight. Yeah. Oh yeah, I feel so bad for him. Yeah, but he's a positive guy and just plays his ass off. Loved it was it. such a big deal in terms of the guitar community for Vivian Campbell to come back and play this style of music again. Oh, yeah. it had been so long, and he's yeah. so fucking good. <laughs> oh, he's so good. I mean, people are going, man, I didn't know you could play like this. Holy shit. You know, Def Leppard's a great band, and they've they got the songs. But it's not a band, you know, we jam on stage, and we do crazy stuff, and he's the only guitar player. Def Leppard's a different kind of uh, atmosphere, you know, so... So he, that's why he's having fun, you know. Then he's playing with me, he's playing with me, who don't know where one's going to come back in. <laughs> <laughs> and getting Jeff Pilson to produce the first two records was that kind of a no-brainer with your history with him? Uh, yeah, Jeff had a nice studio at the time, and uh, everybody knew Jeff, and he was the choice of let, yeah, let's do it. So he was a great producer. And uh, he worked with us on the songs, and then uh, he got a great sound. And we know each other. So Rick knew how Viv played. He knows his sound. He knows my sound. And uh, Jimmy, they lived together at one point, Jimmy and uh, 
I think. No, that was Phil Suzanne, sorry. Uh, but he knows all of us. So that worked out good. And then the second album, we kind of co-produced with us. And then the third album, we just uh, did it ourselves. Well, you brought in Chris Collier, right, for the third record? Yeah, Chris, Chris Collier, to engineer. He's just amazing. You know, he just gets a sound just fat on everything. Everything's loud. You could hear everything. Chris is amazing. Yeah, I just had him on about a month ago. He's a great guy. Um, Jimmy Bain, losing him the way it went down on a cruise, like that's that's really rough. Um, that must have put you guys back on your heels a bit. Yeah, we were doing the cruise with Def Leppard. So we played on the Thursday night at the hall before the boat leaves. And that was good. Jimmy was a little weak. Uh, he, he wasn't looking great, <clears throat> and uh, but he's Jimmy, you know, he gets through everything. <clears throat> the morning of the boat leaving, he's smoking a cigarette, and he died from lung cancer. And he's over there smoking a cigarette. It's like, only Jimmy. So we got <laughs> on the boat, and we didn't have to play till Sunday. So we said, okay, you could rest, you know, anything you need, they'll bring it to you. They had like a butler for the whole band and stuff. And uh, so Jimmy st stayed in his room and uh, they took care of him. And uh, that was like, uh, what was it, Friday? It was good. And s Saturday night, that Leppard's going to play, the big showroom. So we're sitting at the bar. And um, first of all, Joe Elliott lost his voice. And it's like, oh, shit. Now what? So they asked Andy. They said, Andy, do you know these songs? What songs do you know? And Andy said to them, what songs do you know? Because he was in a Def Leppard tribute band. <laughs> so he knew all the songs. So he got up and sang six songs. It was great. And then Kip Winger and uh, Mr. Big Singer. Um, Eric Martin, yeah. Eric got up and they sang some of the songs. And Joe tried to do harmonies and stuff like that. So it was an interesting thing from that perspective. And then we're sitting there before Def Leppard goes on, and this girl comes down in a bar. She's crying. And somehow I knew it's Jimmy. And she goes, I go, what's up? He goes, it's Jimmy. It's Jimmy. And I knew he probably died. I went, oh, what, what's up? He's in his room. He's not moving. The, oh, shit. So I ran up, uh, went up to his room. And there he was, just sitting there. But he was dressed like a rock star. <laughs> That's only Jimmy could do. And feel him, and he's ice cold. Oh, shit, you know. So I, I wanted to make sure there wasn't any funny stuff in the room before the authorities get there. So uh, everything looked fine. He just passed away. And... Uh, that was like, no, man, now what do we do, you know? So got through the Def Leppard gig. Then Sunday we worked on doing a tribute to Jim Jimmy in the same arena. They put together, I don't know who did it, Andy and whoever else put together videos, pictures, like a uh, slideshow thing. We had the Viv's guitar here, Jimmy's bass there, and then uh, <clears throat> Andy... Viv and me sat there with Eddie Trunk, told some stories while the pitches went by, blah, 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 played some music. So it was very touching. People were shocked. They, they came to see the band, and they said, well, we, Eddie announced that Jimmy had passed away. And you could hear the audience go, oh, shit. And, uh, and then we played on uh, that night at the pool with uh, Cinderella's bass player. Was it Eric? Eric. Brittingham? Yeah, he learned five songs quick. We played by the pool real quick uh, so we can play. And, uh, and that's the way it ended, you know. And then Monday we got back in port. But it was the weirdest cruise. <laughs> yeah, I bet. A weird cruise. There weren't a lot of bands on it. There was, uh, I think, a couple of bands other than Def Leppard and us. So. For Last in Line, you've done the three records and you said you've got some, you know, a couple more shows going up. Do you see another record in your future or is this going to be more of a touring project moving on? No, we got a deal on Ear Music. We did the uh, Jericho album 
and uh, and now we'll do a second album. So we have a bunch of stuff that we worked on already. It's not ready to go, but there's the ideas are there. So it's a matter of piecing it together. So we're going to do another record. So we just got to figure out when, because everybody, I live in California. Andy and Phil are in Vegas. Viv's in New Hampshire. So everybody's all over the place. And everybody's got their own schedule now because Viv's going out with Leopard. So Exactly. So what is on the horizon for you now? Um, well, what I did was, uh, I've done this a while ago. I started uh, to go to South America and play with this great band. And we did Sabbath, a lot of all the Sabbath stuff I'm on and some Dio, a little bit of old Sabbath. And I did about four or five tours there. And then uh, went to Europe and I did a couple of tours there too, like 25 shows. Places were packed and they loved it. So I started doing it here last, last year and I call it Sabbath Nights with a K, Sabbath Nights. And uh, we play most of the stuff from uh, the albums I'm on and we play some old Sabbath and some from Heaven and Hell. So the songs you're not going to, you know, you're going to hear Children of the Sea, and uh, the song I from The Humanizer, uh, Turn Up the Night, all the, all the deep cuts. So I did about six, seven shows last year. And now we got some shows coming up. Uh, we're playing the Yakata Theater. Uh, when is that? Uh, on May 18th, the Yakata Theater. May 19th, the Golden Record, St. Louis. And then we got, uh, in L.A., we got the 31st of May, Viper Room. And then uh, Stages on the June 1st, Santa Ana, a place called Stages. It's on, on the website. You can even go to SabbathNights.com. And then we got four or five shows on the East Coast in July. July. So I'm going to keep going with this. You know, that's a lot of fun, playing all this stuff. We're not trying to be a giant band. We're not trying to sell records. This is just like, hey, let's have some fun, you know, and... Uh, People get to hear this, and it's because there's so many tribute stuff out there, you know. So this is kind of a special tribute because I'm the, I was in the band, and nobody else is touring. So, so it's a, a good, uh, good show, you know. So that's what I'm doing, and I do a lot of stuff at a drum company over here every Tuesday, Tuesday 4 p.m. Pacific time, on Facebook, Vinny Apice official, and I do. That, every, that was supposed to be for like three, four months. That's going on three years now. And uh, anything could happen. It's kind of like a hang. I mean, the one I did on Tuesday, I'm sitting here, and the, the camera's here, getting that in the background, the drums. And, and I got an intro tape playing. And then uh, my girlfriend introduces me on the intro tape. She goes, Ladies and gentlemen, Vinny, Mr. Vinny Apice. And I got applause. Yay! So I went to get up and I pushed the chair and the fucking camera fell over. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what do I do? I don't want to start from the beginning. This is stupid. So I picked the camera up. You see my hand going like this. And the fucking camera's going all over the place. So I got the camera up really quickly, but it was crooked. It was like this. Oh, nice. But it looked like, you know, Batman, how they film some of that shit with the camera oh, yeah, angles. Yeah. I've done screams like that uh, let's put the camera crooked so i thought fuck it i'll leave it like that you know so i got on the drums and i leaned like i was falling that way with, <laughs> and i just played and then at the end i said this is what it means when they say the show must go on anything that happens you got to play you know you break a stick you drop a stick you something ha you got to keep going you know because i teach uh, some stuff on there and then i tell stories and then they ask questions. So it's a good show. But it's like a hang. It's not supposed to be perfect. You know, there's no production. There's one camera, a <laughs> couple, of, couple of lights, and it's fun. I do it right here, you know. You said earlier that you do a lot of session work here. How do bands get a hold of you if they want to have you on their record? Well, on my website, I got my email address, drummonster2ms at gmail.com. They send me a thing. They go, hey, I'd love you to play on this, blah, blah, blah. So I'll check it out. And if it sounds good, I'll, okay, you know, I'll do it. Because I like recording and not I keep recording so I don't get rusty on how, how to do this. I'm using Cubase and a couple of uh, outboard things. And 
So I like doing this. So it's fun. So, so if it's heavy and stuff, I'll, I'll do it like that too. And then I do a lot of rock fantasy camps. I've done, uh, there's a fourth one coming up next week. And that's with uh, Chad Smith from the Chili Peppers. Uh, Noodles from... Uh, uh, Offspring? Yes. Yeah. And Nick from uh, three... What is it? Three one oh no three <laughs> three one one or three one three or that band. Yeah, right, all right. It's funny I kept mixing that up. So between all that, um, I'm doing a lot of shit. And then on the 19th of May, I won't be there, but there's a Rock for Ronnie's Cancer Fund. And that's in Warner Center Park in California. That's in the San Fernando Valley on the 19th. And every time they book this, they do a fun, I'm gone. So I haven't done one in years. So I can't do this one either because I'll be in uh, St. Louis at the Golden Record. And then in between all that, I do events. I like to do these horror, horror events, Comic-Con, all those. Um, I do a bunch of those, and uh, we're working on for some for this year as well. So I keep busy. It's, it's fun. That was Vinny Apice. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm traveling this week, so there won't be a show next week, but I'll be back the week after with a new episode. Until then, I'm Brian Sword. Thanks for listening.